Chapter 10, Sand and Sudan. An hour after crossing the border, the road suddenly stopped. It was the end of the road. Tom would not see another proper paved surface for many months to come. He hoped that his bike would be strong enough to cope. He hoped that he would be strong enough to cope. He rode off the smooth tarmac and into the desert. The desert, silence, heat, flat, hot silence in all directions. He sipped from his water bottle, wiped sweat from his eyes and began to ride. Instantly, he was bouncing and shaking around. His bags were rattling and his speed dropped right down. Tom looked around. There were no tall sand dunes or camels like you would imagine you'd find in a desert. There was just a shimmering emptiness. So this was what a desert was like. Wow. Day after day, he moved slowly over the flat, stony plains or dragged his heavy bike through deep sand. He was hot and thirsty, but he knew he had to keep going. He steered by his compass, heading south all the time. At night, he laid his sleeping bag out on the sand, after checking carefully for scorpions, and stared up at the moon as he fell asleep. At dawn, as the orange sun rose slowly over the horizon, Tom would pack away his sleeping bag, eat a handful of dates for breakfast. He had read a book about the Bedouin desert people, and they had always eaten dates. Brush his teeth and put on his shoes. Before he put on his shoes, he had to remember to shake them out to make sure that no scorpions were sleeping inside. This was a funny habit to get into, and Tom often forgot to do it. It was something he had never had to do back in his normal life. But one day, a big fat scorpion crawled out of his shoe while Tom was eating his breakfast. After that, he never, ever forgot to shake his shoes again. Tom checked his compass, even though by now he knew that the sun rose in the east, so that as long as he kept to the sunrise on his left side, then he was heading south and off he went again. Another day had begun. He was making good progress across the Nubian desert. But Tom's bike was heavier than ever. His bags were ran with food and bottles of water. He knew that he had to be very careful to make sure his supplies lasted. He had to save his water, so he did not waste any washing himself or his clothes. He wore the same clothes every day and night, which became crusty and salty with salty sweat. His hair was knotted and tangled and his face was covered in dust and dirt. He was dirty and stinking and disgusting. And he loved it. This was the adventure. This was the desert everybody had told him was impossible. But he was having the time of his life. After three weeks, Tom reached a small town. He rode across the hot sand and back onto a road once more. The road was only made from gravel, but after rattling through the desert, it seemed very luxurious. It felt strange to be back in civilization again. There were flies in the air and old cans and piles of rubbish lying in the streets. The silence was over. He heard engines and music and conversation. But what Tom was most fascinated by was to see people again. Sudanese men wear long flowing white robes and the women wear beautiful multicolored robes. As Tom walked through the village looking for the central water pump where he could refill his bottles and wash his face, he could not stop staring at people. He saw fat people and thin people, tall people and short people, young people and old. He was fascinated how every human looks slightly different, even though they all have two eyes, a nose, a mouth. Being on his own in the wilderness for a long time made Tom much more observant about normal everyday things. He had loved the beauty and the silence of the desert and the successful challenge of trying to survive out there on his own. But he was glad to be back amongst people once again. Chapter 11, Into Ethiopia. Arriving in Khartoum, the capital city of Sudan, Tom pedalled to a junction in the river where two mighty rivers, the Blue Nile and the White Nile, come together and become simply the Nile. He followed the Blue Nile towards its source. The next stage of the journey had begun as he pedalled into the mountainous country of Ethiopia. The children in Ethiopia had never seen anything like Tom and his heavily laden bike. When he rode through Europe, people had looked at Tom carrying all his things in four small bags and thought that he must be a poor person. But in Africa, people looked at Tom carrying so many things in four bags and thought that he must be a rich person. As he rode along, groups of 10, 20 and even 50 young children would chase alongside him to stare at his blonde hair and marvel at his beautiful bicycle. Ethiopians are good long distance runners. And so the children ran along for a long way 
even though Tom was on a bike. Tom thought all of his classmates back in England. None of them would be able to run as far or as fast as these children in Africa. And most of these didn't have any shoes. Even though he was surrounded by many other children, Tom was feeling really lonely. He could not speak Amharic, the Ethiopian language, and the children could not speak English. Tom was missing his family and his friends. He stopped riding, laid his bike down on the dusty earth and sat down on the ground. A big fat tear fell into the dust. For the first time in his journey, Tom wished he was back home. The crowd of Ethiopian children stopped running. They stood in a silent circle around Tom. They could see that he was very upset, but they could not speak English. They could not say anything to cheer him up. Just then, another boy came running across the fields from his home to see where the crowd had gathered. He was the same age as Tom. His name was Abby. Abby thought that life in his village was really boring. Nothing ever happened. As he ran, Abby tried to guess what all the people were looking at. He never imagined that he would find a blonde English boy in the middle of the crowd. Tom looked up as Abby pushed his way through the crowd. Hello, said Tom. He couldn't really be bothered to say hello because nobody could understand him. But his mum always made him say hello to people. It was polite. Hello, answered Abby. Tom's head sprang up as if it was fixed to a spring. His eyes widened. Can you speak English? Tom asked. Yes, I can speak English, replied Abby shyly. Abby's dad was the local teacher. Just for fun, and ever since Abby was tiny, he had been teaching his son little bits of English. Abby had enjoyed learning the strange sounding words, but he had not imagined that he would ever really actually meet an English person. When he saw Tom sitting on the dusty ground in the centre of all the people, Abby was excited, but he also felt embarrassed. All the other children in the crowd were not staring at Tom anymore. They were staring at Abby, amazed that he seemed to be able to talk to a strange boy on the bicycle. My name is Tom. What's your name? I am Abby. Where are you from? What are you doing here? Why do you have a bicycle? Abby had so many questions to ask that he didn't know what to ask first, and he was not giving Tom any time to answer them. Tom smiled as the rush of questions and explained that he was from England. He was trying to cycle round the world. It always sounded like a crazy thing to say to people. But just then, it sounded really, really silly, as all Tom wanted to do was go home. All the other boys and girls began shouting at Abby. Who is he? What is he saying? Can you understand him? Where has he come from? Is he lost? Why is there a bicycle? What's in his bag? Why is he so dirty? Everyone was talking at once, wanting to know about Tom and his adventure. They were all laughing and smiling. Tom didn't feel so lonely anymore. He answered Abby's questions and then started to ask some of his own. Why can't you all run so far? Why are you carrying spears? Why do you think I was doing? What do you think I was doing here? Abby explained that every day he and his friends had to travel many miles to go to the nearest school. But there was no school bus and nobody in the village owned a car. So they all had to travel on foot. Walking took too long, so they would run instead. Running every day meant that everyone was fit and fast. They would also run back home again at lunchtime when school ended for the day. Tom wished his school finished at lunchtime. But Abby explained that in Ethiopia, many children had to work in the afternoons to help their families earn enough money to buy food. That was why some of the boys were carrying long, sharp spears. They were supposed to be looking after the sheep in the fields, protecting the animals from danger. But the sight of Tom on his bicycle had been too much for them to resist. They had abandoned their sheep and came running along to join in the fun. Why don't you come and meet my family? Abby asked Tom. You can spend the night with us. And you can try some Ethiopian food, some injera. Thanks a lot, said Tom. That would be great. I'm always hungry these days and I'd love to see your house. So Tom waved goodbye to the crowd of children who smiled and waved back. Then he pushed his heavy bike, helped by Abby, across the dry and stony fields. He was feeling much happier. Outside the house was a small field with some vegetables growing in it. Abby's house was small and round with walls made from baked mud. The roof sloped steeply. It was made from bundles of long grass tied together. Smoke was streaming through the roof. It looked as though the house was on fire. Don't worry, said Abby. My mum must be cooking. But she is not burning the food. We cook on an open fire in our house and it gives off a lot of smoke. My mum is a very good cook. You're going to love her food.
Then Abby shouted in a loud voice something in Armoric, which Tom could not understand. Abby's parents, three brothers and two sisters, all came out of the small house. They were very surprised when they saw Tom. Abby explained that Tom came from England and was riding his bike all the way around the world. The family gasped in shock and laughed, then eagerly took Tom into the house. He was a very unusual visitor. Abby told Tom that he was very welcome and that they had arrived at the perfect moment. It was dinner time. One of the things Tom was enjoying most about riding around the world was trying so many different kinds of foods. It was not always delicious, but it was always interesting. And it made a nice change from banana sandwiches. Ethiopian food was one of the most unusual he had tried so far. They all sat on the floor, low, around a circular table. The family asked Tom lots of questions about his expedition. Abby, or his dad, the teacher, translated their questions. Then Abby's mum placed a large round tray on the table. It was covered with what looked like a huge pancake. This bread is called injera, said Abby. In Ethiopia, we eat it almost every day. On top of the injera were heaps of stews and cooked vegetables. There were no plates or knives and forks. Abby showed Tom how to eat in the Ethiopian style. He tore off a piece of injera with his hand and used it to scoop up some vegetables. He popped it into his mouth and smiled as he chewed. Next it was Tom's turn. The whole family watched Tom's face to see if he liked the food. Abby's mum, who had cooked the meal, watched the most carefully of all. Tom tore off a piece of injera and began to eat. After such an eventful day, Tom was really hungry, so the food tasted especially good. He smiled and said, Amos of Delangelo, which means, thank you, in Armoric. He liked the food very much. It was very spicy. Everyone laughed. They were happy that Tom enjoyed their food. Then the whole family began to eat together from the same giant piece of injera, sharing the food. Everyone was talking all the time as well as eating all the time. It was a very noisy meal. There were so many questions to ask and so much to learn about each other's countries. Abby's mum was shocked to learn that people in England do not eat injera. And Tom learned that in Ethiopia, it was actually a different year than in England. The Ethiopian calendar is seven years later than the rest of the world's calendar. Even telling the time is different. Rather than starting a day at midnight, as Tom was used to, on Ethiopian time, the day begins at sunrise. So one hour after sunrise is called one o'clock in the morning. The house was very small, so there was not a spare bed for Tom to sleep in. But that did not matter. He was very tired and was happy to just roll out his sleeping bag and sleep on the floor. In the morning, as he packed, Tom thanked his new friends for looking after him so well. As he cycled away, the family waved right until he had ridden out of sight, on towards the next new friends he would meet, and on towards the, fa the really steep roads of Ethiopian highlands. Abby's kind family had really cheered Tom up, and he was excited about his adventure once again. For the next few weeks, Tom rode through the mountains. The road was really rocky and bumpy, and his poor bike took a battering. Monkeys swung in the trees overhead, watching as Tom pedalled slowly past. The biggest mountains he had ever seen towered above and around him, and he had to sweat and pant all his way up all over them. His legs ached every evening, but he felt his muscles growing too, and the downhills were the best. Tom definitely felt ready for a cool swim by the time he reached Lake Tana, Ethiopians, Ethiopia's biggest lake. He had been told there were crocodiles in the lake, but he was so desperate for a refreshing dip that he thought it was worth the risk. He only had a very short swim, just in, crocs, just in case the crocs did decide they were hungry. After the dry Middle East, the desert in Sudan, the rocky mountains, he had just ridden through, Lake Tana seemed especially beautiful. Colourful bushes grew on the shore and green trees waved in the breeze. Pelicans flew through the sky and the cormorants dried their wings in the sunshine before diving into the lake to catch fish. Lake Tana is usually described as the beginning of the Blue Nile. From the lake, this branch of the world's longest river crashes over a massive waterfall and then flows all the way down to the sea in Egypt. So Tom had now cycled the whole length of the river. It was an important landmark. He treated himself to a banana sandwich in the shade of a big tree. As he chewed, his thoughts turned to his next big adventure, crossing the equator and riding into the southern half of the world. Next back here in Tom's diary.